Right, welcome to today's seminar. Uh, just some housekeeping um, to begin with. Um, so today will be a double structure like last week. So I'm going to do the first one on geometric deep learning part two. And then Jordi uh, will talk about um, saliency and his, his own work in the second half. And then next week, uh, we're going to start with the, the, the real stuff where the experts are going to talk. So um, Adam Zold, um, Wagner is going to be our first speaker. So we're very excited that one more housekeeping rule, the usual one, which is our seminar principles. So questions, please interrupt. They're, they're welcome. OK, so I'm going to talk about manifold learning uh, today. Um, so last week, Jordi talked about um, if you, uh, you know, want to preserve some equivariance and kind of, you know, the symmetry group. And here we're going to talk about that we assume the data occupy some space that lies on a, on a manifold, but we do not know the manifold. Can we still do something about that? So um, examples for such a manifold uh, would be, for example, in PDEs, if you have an inertial manifold, so you know you have an infinite, potentially infinite dimensional space, but the actual dynamics happens on a manifold in a much lower dynamical space. Um, and here is another example, which are pictures. So in pictures, in images, you, can rotate, you can translate, it will still be the same person. And there are more degrees of freedom than just kind of the, you know, the uh, solid body rotations. And for each facial muscle that you have, you have a degree of freedom. And now these images here, they, you can find sort of some smooth transformations through the sort of that use, you know, continuous deformations of these uh, facial muscles and uh, to go from one to the other one. You can have a tongue sticking out. That's another you know, a degree of freedom that um, you can do. Notice here that um, the hair is complex, right? So if there were wind, the hair would go in all directions. But I assume what that would mean, let's imagine this is the, the manifold for our pictures, just I mean, as, a, as a cartoon, then it just means that the, we have some kind of distribution. It's probably noise. In the 80s, it wouldn't have been noise with all the hairspray, but I mean, kind of, uh, otherwise it's just noise uh, around that manifold. Uh, and you could still, um, uh, you could still kind of define a meaningful manifold on which those, uh, um, those images live. Same as for texts. Um, this is actually highly non-trivial, right? Um, that we say there's an actual manifold. Um, so it's clear that real images occupy just a smaller space uh, of, let's say, all you know, pixel combinations that we have. But it's not clear that there is, for all you know, all those things, there's an actual you know, smooth manifold that we can travel along. So Jordi, for example, said that if we have the, 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 blacks, the black image, then it's a singular point. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's not, we, we work under this hypothesis, but it's a non-trivial hypothesis. And if you look at faces, for example, um, you know, face of a human, and then you have a face of some tapeworm, um, there would be probably two different manifolds, okay? So each of them may be manifold, but they're not going to be connected. Um, so the aim of this manifold learn learning is the following. Um, we want to find a good set of coordinates um, that are on this, you know, that kind of parameterize our manifold. So, and why would we do want to do that? So one one reason could be that we could put in now, uh, we could express our data in terms of these coordinates to help then the learning. So this would be our, would be like a pre-training pre where we learn the coordinates and then we start the machine learning as we've kind of discussed in the last couple of weeks. And um, so this all goes under this umbrella of, uh, Jordi called it the inductive bias, or we call it prior information that we may have or uh, this kind of general framework of regularization where we got this kind of architecture given of our neural net and we want to sort of condense the space where we're looking at um, to minimize the generalization error. So we're trying now to um, think about how can we find these good coordinates. Um, so there are linear methods, so most widely and, and probably uh, well known. One is principal component analysis, PCA, or also known under kahun Löwe decomposition, and that does the following. So let's say we have points in some uh, RD. We got N of those points. And now we find, want to find a hyperplane and such that if we project the point onto the hyperplane, square this distance, sum it all up for each of the, of the data points, 
then that's minimized. So we want to find the hyperplane. That means we want to find those basis vectors phi such that we get this uh, uh, minimal distance. You do that. And um, so that's principal component analysis. Uh, the way it works is um, you calculate or you construct the covariance matrix for your data. Um, and then you do an eigen decomposition. And then these phi's here, they're given by as the first sort of p eigenvectors uh, of those um, of this covariance matrix. So p is smaller than d. And you would typically choose a p where the eigenvalues have decayed sufficiently, uh, sufficiently, uh, uh, have sufficiently decayed. So this means we have a now a dimension reduction rather than uh, our x that lives in d cross, uh, cross n here. We now have p cross n, and p is, can be significantly or should be significantly smaller than the d. Then we have achieved some dimension reduction, and we can now express our our data in terms of coefficients of this uh, principal components. And so I'm going to give you some examples where it works well and where it doesn't work that well. So here, this is an almost linear manifold. So we got all the points here. And these eigendirections are the ones that capture most of the variance, right? We said we have to look for the eigenvalue of the, of the variance. Um, so that would be this direction here where there's not much variance kind of perpendicular to that. So it works reasonably well, if, even if it's not exactly nonlinear, but just um, almost linear. However, consider this spiral here that we sort of sample. And um, so that's a nonlinear manifold. And now um, let's plot just the projections of our data points onto the principal uh, first, first eigenvector. Then here where there's lots of data points, you get lots of crosses. Here, wherever you have like a turning point, you get a bit more points. So you have this one kind of high, uh, you know, high, uh, populated with a high density, but this is clearly not a good representation of, of the manifold. So we have to do something else when, we, when we're dealing with nonlinear manifolds. Um, obvious idea is that you just extend this locally. You kind of have local local regions. You can take like nearest neighbors or any any kind of measure for for locality that that you like, and just patch it in terms of linear um, linear models. But um, I would like to discuss some nonlinear method here, and um, so the idea here is is, is different. Here we. Um, want to change how we represent data, and the, this representation should preserve local distances. So when we have a nonlinear manifold, we are interested in, in uh, everything is kind of you know, uh, encoded in the local, uh, local structure of the manifold. And so the idea is the following. We have some set X. Um, this could be abstract objects, a text or image or something like this. Then by employing some similarity uh, measure, uh, we gonna construct, what's this? Screen broadcasting, maybe. Um, then we're gonna construct a graph where uh, each node is one um, element of X and nodes are connected if they're similar in the original data set. And now um, the trick is to look at functions on this graph, and then use it as um, to construct an embedding in Euclidean space Rn. Okay, and again, so here we have similarity preserving. Here we have local distance preserving. So the, the, we want that some kind of distance measure on this graph. If two points on this graph are close in um, in, in in some sense, where were we? Uh, ah, yeah, the local distance preserving uh, um, kind of theme that runs through here by some similarity preserving here, and then a local distance preserving so that something that's close by well, some metric that's defined on functions on graphs will be close in, in the Euclidean space in Rn. And um, the idea I'm gonna present here is uh, diffusion maps, which was uh, introduced by Kaufmann and Lafon. And um, they explore the global structure of a non-linear uh, non manifold um, by, locally exploring with diffusion and then exp uh, uh, letting that diffusion sort of explore uh, uh, globally. So you start local with diffusion, which is, you know, locally you increase, and then you sum up that information by letting diffuse random walk on, a, on the graph. Uh, 
So the question was, what is diffusion in this context? So it's going to, it's going to be random walk on a graph. So let's do step one first. So that's how we'd go from uh, X to this, um, to this graph. So a standard kind of method that that's been used is just introduce some kernel. We already had kernel, but now we take specific kernels, which we, we require them to be symmetric and we require them to be um, sort of positivity preserving. So um, we want that uh, it's, it's uh, non-negative, uh, um, the kernel. So that means if you bang in a positive function into the operator that you know associated with a kernel, you're gonna get a positive output. So here's just an example of a Gaussian. So this epsilon here is a resolution. So imagine epsilon very small, then you can, if it, if it goes to zero, you will only, and you have like a finite graph, you will only see your one point. It's the only neighbor. Then you increase the epsilon and you can increase kind of the resolution. You can you know, take more and more points on the graph in the kind of effective support of your of your kernel and so if you take now elements x y um, from your set so um, then what you end up with with this with this kernel here if you just um, take for x and for y two elements here of of uh, your capital x um, then you can generate a graph where each data point is a node and the strength is given by by the kernel here. So the adjacency matrix uh, of that graph is just given by the kernel of x i x j. Okay. So you're going to end up with a weighted uh, undirected graph. And um, let's now do step two, which is looking at functions on this graph. So we're going to look at diffusion and um, then think about how that can generate an embedding um, in, into Rn. So we're going to construct a random walk. And first we describe a transition probability P. Oh, RD, let's call it RD here. Yeah, sorry, thank you. Let's just call this RD. It's not the same, uh, yeah. Uh, because X1 and X2, these are just samples drawn randomly from you know, your, your set, let's say. So the index being closed doesn't mean that the kernel here that they will be you know next to each other in the euclidean distance let's say if they're in rn rd so this this is a weighting function so let's let's look at this exponential so if x and y are far away then it's basically zero okay so they yeah there's a threshold is that what you mean like that, that i don't have 10 to the minus 10 there yes that's right so there's some kind of thresholding that i put in yes thank you yeah so the, like there's some kind of effective uh, um, support of your of your kernel. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so now um, let's construct this random walk. So first thing is we're going to construct a transition probability. So I'm going to use x and y as you know. There's some kind of my x is some space where I've, you know uh, where I have x's and y's continuously distributed, and then when I actually given a data set, they're just you know drawn randomly from that, uh, from that data set. Okay, so, but I'm gonna do the, the exposition now, assuming this continuous, um, this continuous distribution. So I have my kernel, now I'll normalize it by integrating over the measure of my, how I draw the Y uh, variables. And that's similar to a degree. So if you had a matrix, this would just be the sum of your AIJ. So this is kind of, you know, in, in the, if you like prefer the, the, um, uh, um, uh, the finite case of a graph, then it's just, you know, the, the sum of a row. Um, then associated with that um, kernel, we can now um, construct this, or uh, associated with that is this uh, operator capital P, that X on functions F of X um, in, in, you know, this usual way, and that's an averaging operator. So constants are uh, preserved as constants, okay? And now this is, you notice that this is a non-symmetric uh, um, non uh, 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 kernel here, or this P, this transition kernel P is non-symmetric, but you can conjugate it and um, it has real eigenvalues. Uh, you can conjugate and make it symmetric then it has real eigenvalues. Um, and the eigenfunctions we call psi and psi naught is, you know, the constant, that's eigenvalue one. You can put in here like a constant and with the, uh, so if you ignore this, then this is uh, going to be again, you know, one by the normalization. And so constants are 
uh, eigenfunctions with eigenvalue one. Um, and you can, uh, but because it's uh, uh, not symmetric, there's also going to be left eigen, uh, so adjoint uh, uh, eigenfunctions. Um, we're going to uh, see them in a minute. And you can also now look at transition probabilities in several steps. So there's a whole family of transition kernels indexed by t here, and t is the number of steps that you want to go from x to y. Okay. And now, um, because <coughs> you, under some, some conditions, you have an of compactness of this operator, you can uh, then spectrally decompose your transition kernel for each t. And these are the psi's from up here. And these are just the, the ones from the adjoint, the eigenfunction of the adjoint operator. And now you see, you've got this lambda, you've got these eigenvalues here uh, to the t. These eigenvalues are all in absolute value less than one. So we're gonna, we're gonna ignore contributions once we've decayed sufficiently, sufficiently fast. And that means we only need to sum up to some p, which is smaller than d. Uh, and uh, we've already achieved some, um, some reduction in dimensionality. And now we're gonna use this transition kernel for each t to define uh, a metric, uh, a distance on the graph. Okay, and that's called they all, Kaufmann and Lafont. They uh, term this the, def, the family of diffusion distances. So again, it's a family parametrized by by t. And what it does is the following: we, we take p t of x and u minus p of t of y comma u, and in, square it and integrate over all the u with a weight that's just here because it's a non-symmetric matrix. Don't worry about the weight here. Um, and so. What does that mean? Um, what does it measure? So it distinguishes um, these three points here, which roughly have the same distance. So distance on a graph is typically, or you can take the geodesic distance. So these here have roughly the same geodesic distance. However, this distance measure here sums up over all other vertices u, and then it will be small if you have, for example, a short pass like this, and they're all these kind of views, and they have roughly the same probability. And so you, you subtract them here. Whereas if you have just one pass or like a few pass connecting, like these ones here, or also from here, you know, there's not many pass connecting this node and that node, they will be weighted as uh, th that will give a large distance in this metric. Okay. So you have can have the same. Kind of uh, inverted commas Euclidean distance with well, geodesic distance on the graph, but that as can have a very different diffusive distance. Okay. And so that is a distance measure uh, we're going to use to kind of have a local, which means you can get to it by diffusion in a few steps um, measure. And now we express this. Yeah, less, that's right. So the question was um, if we want to look see this as Brownian motion. So, I mean, here it's just the hop uh, where probabilities are weighted, you know, are given by, you know, the adjacency matrix, you know, normalized by the one on the degree. Um, so you've got this, all these random walks and the diffusion is, sorry, the distance is small. If there are many of those shorter paths, um, I'm com you know, are connecting two vertices and it's large if there's not that many connecting them. And so now we've sort of defined a metric, and this metric allows us now, um, using the spectral decomposition up here, so using the orthogonality of the psi's and the phi's, to convert this into Euclidean distance, okay, in, our, in RP. Okay, so these psi's, the coordinates of this psi's that live in RP, are just the psi's evaluated. Uh, uh, for each of the components, psi. So the, the first psi one is the first eigenfunction psi two up to psi p, evaluated at a point x, and then with the coefficients given by the associated eigenvalues to the power of t. Okay, so that now allows us to go kind of from, from you know, from first from uh, uh, our abstract uh, uh, space x, construct a graph, and then have an embedding in RP. Okay, where we can use normal Euclidean distance to, to measure uh, distances. Yes, please. 
oh, the question was, how do I know what P is? So I have all these eigenvalues. You can compute them, right? So the question is, how, how do we decide on, uh, on this dimension P, which should be smaller than the original dimension D? And if you look at this uh, spectral decomposition here, we have access to all those, the eigenvalues and the psi's, the eigenfunctions and the phi's. And now if that, I, if for all the L's here um, that are larger than P, the lambda to the T, the lambda L to the T is sufficiently small, I just neglect the rest of that term. It's not completely zero, it's kind of a similar thing to, to uh, what Odette asked, right? So we're just gonna set it to zero then. We're just gonna ignore it. We're gonna say that the, the main part is gonna be described by the first P eigenfunctions. For example, let, let's say you have an image where you only rotate in two ways. I'm gonna show you that, right? So there's just two degrees of freedom that you can you know, continuously deform those pictures. So you know that two coordinates should be enough. So you can sort with two and you're gonna see something. You can sort with one, it's not gonna be good. You can sort with two, it's gonna be fine. You can sort with three, it's also gonna be fine, but you're not gonna gain much. Okay, so that's kind of how you can can kind of decide on, on that. Yeah, you have the question is what, what about the kernel? And um, you have freedom in, in the kernel. I mean, the Gaussian is just one choice, yes. Uh, Martin asks, are you looking for a spectral gap? If we have a spectral gap, yes, that would be ideal, right? Yeah, right. So here, just a summary of what we just done. We have some kind of data points given from X. We construct a kernel. Then we construct functions on our graph. Uh, the psi's uh, that are associated with the diffusion process. And then we construct this diffusion map uh, using those uh, coordinates uh, coming from the eigenfunctions, okay? And we have a reduction from RD to RP here. And at each step, we try to preserve similarity or local distances. And we explore by diffusing and increasing the T, so to speak, Right? not so to speak, increasing the T uh, and um, diffusing further and further and exploring the manifold, the global structure of the manifold. And here's this example that I uh, copied from Cosman and Lafon's paper. So they've taken an image of 3D, just the, you know, the, the, the letter 3D, and then they turned it and, and photographed the, the 3D thing from different, or this object 3D thing from different angles, and they turned it in this way. So there's two degrees of freedom, this angle, and this angle. And indeed, if you, and then they just have a random collection of those, of those uh, photos, right, of those images. So there's in no, in no particular order they, they feed them in. Build the similarity kernel, build the graph to the diffusion, and then determine these diffusion uh, 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 coordinates. And here, if you just use two, so each of them should then be for one of the degrees of freedom that we have. Um, you can see that there's a nice ordering here. So along this one, we have that angle. And along this coordinate here, we have that angle. Okay, so that's the, and there was no ordering in the original data set. Okay, uh, the question is, what was the kernel in that example? I think it was a Gaussian, if I remember correctly. That's right. So you take, you take a vector in R to the 1000 or whatever, and then, yeah, make it in Gaussian. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, now, if our space X is now in Rn, so it's not some kind of abstract space, but we actually given points in Rn, then we can even say more, then uh, you can do a little bit more. And so now we want to look at diffusion in some kind of, you know, some manifold M that lies in Rn. And what's encoding this diffusion is like the Laplace Beltrami operator, okay? And now what uh, Kaufman and Lafon did was the following. They introduced a family of uh, diffusions and they did that in the following way. They again specify a kernel, again with an uh, uh, epsilon as a free parameter. And here's uh, two kind of kernels with different epsilons. So again, it's this resolution aspect that, are, um, that we discussed before. And then you build, you, you, you take, now we have a density. We are sort of on, on um, on the manifold, so the y's are drawn from the manifold here, but the density doesn't have to be necessarily homogeneously or uniformly distributed over the manifold. You know, you can have clumps where you now you have like at this part of the manifold, you just have 
you know, higher density, a higher probability of drawing, you know, from that part of the manifold than from another part of the manifold, right, in your data. Um, and so you build this, uh, you know, a density that, that you convolve here with the kernel, and then you introduce this alpha. And the alpha tells us here how we uh, um, uh, weigh our, um, or normalize our, um, our kernel. Um, and then we can again now normalize this um, into make it into a probability transition kernel. That would be our P epsilon alpha. So there's the epsilon and there's the alpha, uh, where we just take that kernel here and normalize it with this degree, uh, uh, the degree function here, okay, as usual. And associated with that, again, you have an operator um, acting on function functions f. And now they showed the following. You can now look at the, the generator of this Markov chain. So again, we have, you know, we have an operator P that describes the diffusion. Um, and we can look at the generator. Uh, and so epsilon is here like time. Um, and they found the following. They found that depending on alpha, you get different limits. One, well, yes. And if you set alpha equal to zero, you get the Laplace Beltrami, but with this kind of correction term. Um, and Q is the original density, how the data are distributed on, uh, on the manifold. So if Q is uniformly, uh, if, if the data, uh, data are uniformly distributed, then um, you know, this Laplace Beltrami Q is zero, and you recover the actual Laplace Beltrami operator that tells us about the local geometry uh, um, of where the data live. If you, for alpha equal to one, there is no such condition. So no matter how the, uh, the data are distributed on the manifold, you always recover in the limit the, um, the Laplace Beltrami operator. And then sort of for people studying stochastic processes or where you assume that your, um, your data are generated by some uh, um, larger equation, let's say, then um, alpha equal to one half is the one that you can probe the uh, manifold on which those data lie. So then um, you can show that this, um, this generator then um, converges to the generator of a Fokker-Planck equation that describes the um, propagation of densities on this. Okay, uh, there was a question here. With the diffusion map you get an immersion local embedding, when you extend this manifold, how would you know that it is a global embedding or do you just extend and hope for the best? You explore it globally by letting t go by, by, by considering more and more steps okay so local really local is just taking the nearest neighbors right kind of you just take one step and exploring that but by taking more and more steps you kind of extend into global um, um, you get global global information so question a uh, follow-up question is this the best way to embed it Yes, I don't know, uh, might not be. Um, just a couple of comments here on, on advantages and disadvantages. So first advantage is we, we, we achieved a, a reduction in dimension. So if we start with RD, we can go to RP. So we're much smaller in this image uh, example. It was very clear. We only needed two parameters. Um, and we can also allow to, uh, we, we, we can, by using epsilon, the resolution all the time, we can kind of also explore sort of different scales. So we can, you know, kind of say, well, okay, on a certain scale, we have a manifold, even if it's kind of locally very rugged or something, um, by allowing um, allowing different scales of, of T and epsilon. And another advantage is that we can deal with time series. Um, if they come from an SDE, that uh, lives on a manifold. That is uh, where the data are drawn from the manifold, yeah. Uh, disadvantage are of a computational nature. So the kernel is n cross n. If we have lots of data, that's a um, huge matrix. Um, and the error of approximation is, you see you have, if this is the kind of effective support of the kernel, okay, then the scales like, this is like square root of epsilon the radius, and now that to the power of D, so epsilon to the D on two times N, which is the number of points we're gonna, we're gonna have. So that's kind of like an, 
an effective sam a, 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 a sample size now. So that's the effective number that we, we're actually doing statistics over is sort of, of of this order. And then it's just a central limit kind of theorem argument to say, okay, that's just one over this effective number, a square root over this effective number. And that gives you this one. I believe this can be improved. This is just a very rough right uh, estimate, but it sort of shows you that to get good accuracy, which means that we have this uh, convergence here. Um, we need to choose, you know, very small epsilons. And if we have a very small epsilon, we need to choose large number of data. And then our matrix also gets bigger. So um, it works, you know, probably well for small kind of dimension for small number of, of uh, degrees of freedom and, and things like that. Okay. The question of is, is why why does it work? Is there some kind of intuition of why it works? So if we say that kind of the geometry on a manifold is encoded locally, we need to look for local distance measures. Okay, and all the measures we've employed here, everything has been local, and then we extend by diffusion, exploring larger, you know, like more part of the data, like a larger part of the data. So the question is, if you sample randomly from Rn, and now you do the same spiel. So um, what would you get? I think you would need all of the, there would be no, spe there, there would be no spectral, spectral gap, right? You couldn't, you couldn't truncate. Okay, and now there's another way of um, learning about manifolds or learning about um, directions that matter. Um, and they're the so-called autoencoders. So it's a very strange concept uh, on, on first sight. You, you start with an X, let's say it lives in RD. Now you map your X somehow with an encoder to an H and that lives in RN. And then you map with a decoder back into RD, into some R, and now you try to learn the identity. So you try to learn the parameters that determine your, 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 your encoder F and, and those that determine your decoder G in such a way that G composed with F of X is close to X. And you say, well, this is strange. Why do I want to learn the identity? But the idea is, if you, you train it on, let's say, one on, on, on my face, and then it learns my face, the, mapping the identity. And now if I take Jordi's face, then it would fail because it learned you know, my, my face. So the idea is that you, um, if you have a loss function here, uh, where you measure the distance between X and then the reconstruction, uh, this kind of auto-encoded X, that that is small and Hopefully, it will be large on any uh, uh, on any non uh, non data. So one extreme case is if you overfit it, if you just learn the labels, let's say, um, then I fit the data perfectly from a training set, but then that's obviously not really saying anything about my face. That would just say something about that specific training data set. So that's something we want to avoid. Um, and applications for this is again learning kind of salient features or you know good coordinates. So um, again, we would then map it to some Rn, our data, and then feed those features into our, um, our neural net, um, and then start you know, uh, using the deep, um, deep neural networks that we discussed before. Uh, you can use it for anomaly detection. So um, if for some uh, uh, inputs x, then should be close to what we believe uh, uh, there should be. So another photo of, of myself then, let's say, um, and let's say there's some kind of, it's not me, it's someone who kind of dresses up like me, then that hopefully that, um, uh, uh, that loss function would be large. And you can also use it for image denoising, kind of, this is kind of similar to the salient features. You map it, you map your picture up and then uh, and, 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 uh, map it back down to get rid of the noise. Okay, so if you only extract the salient features, you kind of uh, smooth out the noise there. So these are some, of those um, applications. Um, if the dimension of this H here is 
smaller than the dimension in here. We have achieved again some dimension reduction. So again, this would be like learning the most salient features. Um, another remark I want to make, let's say these F and G's here are linear. So affine linear transformation of X up to here, and then another affine linear uh, uh, down, down to R. Um, then if we use as a loss function, the mean squared error, this is actually equivalent to, um, to, to PCA, what we studied before. This would just be uh, another linear map. But we don't have to make it linear. We can take, and we don't even have to make it into one function. We could just have, again, like a um, convolutional network, or there's lots of different layers to get us from X to this uh, feature H here. Okay, so there's a lot of, um, uh, a lot of freedom we have. And I want to make, again, the, the kind of the point here. So let's say we have training data xi, and let's, we, we, we learn with f, we learn just the index i here. And then with g, we learn how to map i to xi. So that is the identity. But that is, of course, silly. Um, that doesn't extract any salient features or anything. So um, that we want to avoid that. And how do we avoid that? It's, you know, this would be an overfitting. So we go again through this kind of procedure of, of regularization. And um, so I'm going to just mention three different uh, regularized autoencoder uh, um, ideas here. Um, so the first one is, again, um, where we have some constraint here on some norm or omega of H is some kind of, uh, could be like the L1 norm of the features, let's say. So this is very similar to the regularization that we discussed, you know, the kind of Tikhonov regularization and things like this, or the Lasso regularization. Um, but careful, this is different. This is a constraint on the features um, for all the uh, regularizations that we discussed before. It was regularizing the weights. Here we actually put a constraint on the features. Um, so it's a different type of, of uh, regularization, but you might want features that are sparse where you just really, you know, threshold some things to zero or um, that you have a sparse representation in that feature space. This again could be some prior information that you have about the salient features. Um, then the next one is a uh, denoising autoencoders. So if we can corrupt our uh, inputs, the X, the data that we're given, we can corrupt them with noise. And then we can ask, the, we can construct a loss function where we measure the, uh, we want to minimize the distance between the original image X and then the reconstructed image that goes from noisy image back to, uh, back to here, the, uh, the identity map sort of for the noisy image. So that forces you not to just learn the identity map and to copy but also to get rid of the noise because you compare it with a noiseless original data. So you corrupt yourself the data with noise, map it down with the autoencoder, compare it with the original one and train it sort of to uncorrupt the data. Okay, so that gives you some kind of robust, that kind of builds in some robustness um, in the autoencoder. Um, and then I want to finish uh, with what's called the contractive autoencoder. So this is where we have this, um, this omega of H here um, is just um, a condition on the gradient of the, um, uh, of the feature map F here, of this map F that maps from X to H. And we penalize, we penalize any functions F here that um, make large changes in X. If I change X a little bit, that will have a large effect on the age. And that you can kind of interpret in terms of, uh, so coming back to the manifolds, so you want, you, you want the directions, uh, you don't want directions where you have, um, um, where you're not going to change much. The salient features are the ones, you know, along the tangent of your manifold. So there you have these uh, changes, um, meaningful changes of your of your features. So this is in some way um, kind of closest to this manifold idea uh, for the autoencoders. And I think I leave it with that. You can, so the question is how do we imagine this? What is this F? Um, and you can imagine it as a deep, uh, deep net itself. It could just be, uh, it, could, it can be anything, any function, right? It can be linear. You have a lot of freedom 
Um, but yeah, a lot, I mean, uh, uh, CNNs are used a lot uh, from what I've seen. Um, so F and, and Gs are CNNs. And then, um, yeah, you can still do the diffusion. So the question is what happens um, if you have a torus, for example, um, you can still do the diffusion. Question is, do, uh, do we get some extra information? Um, I don't think, I think you just get those, you know, those two uh, uh, degrees of freedom that like for, for, for the two torus. Question here from Joel. Um, oh, there's two. Hold on, Joel. Is the autoencoder guided by something that is processing age? Uh, for example, at the same time that I'm training the autoencoder, am I also training model which accepts age and does some kind of classification? You train F and, and, and G at the same time. Is that, is that your question? Do I understand it correctly? So the loss function really takes G of F of X. So you take, you take them at the same time. You train it at the same time. And it's not a classification. It's really, this is not, you know, this lives in, in RD. That's right. So once you got that, the idea is use that H here and plug that into your actual deep neural network, right, as your input. And, and then you can do classification on that or, or what have you. So then, then the actual training starts. Learning starts, I should say. Could that constraint uh, also be seen to filter for structure in a certain subspace? Um, I guess so. Um, you could, like, if you, if you know something about noise uh, or if you know something about corruptions that, you know, you can, you, you want to train against corruptions in a certain uh, direction, you can, yeah, you can, you can prop that noise. I guess it's, that's a good idea, I guess. Right, so if you, if, um, uh, I can't think of an example on the spot, but let's say you, well, you want, you, you want to kind of safeguard yourself against certain, uh, certain corruptions, right? Or certain that you, that you, you know, I mean, it's kind of, it's, I, I guess it goes back to the uh, initial idea. You want to, you want the autoencoder to work well for, you know, your class or system that you like. Uh, and you don't want it to work for for things that are outside. So if there's a particular outside that you really don't work uh, uh, that you don't want, you don't want to use that noise in there. You kind of want to use noise where you expect kind of closeness to be. No, it can be any noise. I just wrote noise, right? Noise is usually not white. I uh, think of recordings. So you can use any noise, but I thought you could also use maybe particular noise to help um, against certain attacks or again, you know, uh, uh, um, delineating um, what you want the training data set from part that you think you really don't want, want to, uh, your autoencoder to work. Just here to determine a good value of age, anything there? Um, again, a, uh, um, the good value of age, I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand uh, the question. So age is just the output of, of your function f. So. This lives in some R, what is that, N, and this lives in some RD. And F could be a CNN. So um, the things that you optimize is F and G. And then what you get out is if you now find, you know, you optimized your, you, you found uh, the parameters that, that give you that low value of this, of the loss function. That means you now have an F and now you can construct G, uh, H's from any X, okay? So now you have a mapping from any X to H. Um, and so it's not really a value. Um, I'm not, maybe I misunderstood the question. And only some will produce a nice embedding for my neural network though. So dimension of target space Rn. Um, Right. Yeah, I don't know how to um, how to choose how to choose that, but I mean, you could try large and put a constraint. Uh, could have, could put a, you could put a sparsity constraint on, and that will try to have an you know an effective uh, a smaller dimension. But yeah, I, I don't know how to how, how to choose that. That's a good question. Um, I mean, ideally, you want it to be. If you want, if you're interested in dimension reduction, you know, the typical the typical application would be you want n smaller than d, 
So Stefan asked, what, yeah, if n is larger than d, then also you need the regularization. Compressing data the same. Well, this is a data compression, right? If you, let, let's say you take an image that is, you know, an RD. Now you compress it into an RN and N is smaller than D, then you can, you know, use that RN to construct your actual image via G, okay? So the compression would be taking your image, take, take the Im image of the image under F, which is H, and that would be a compressed image. So too many images. But I, 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 I think you know what I mean. Because G then allows you to reconstruct the actual photo. That's better. 